And good evening, brothers and sisters. It is so nice to see all of you. How are you? All right. You can laugh. It's okay to laugh at the pastor. He's a human being, right? So tonight we go right into it, and our topic is the enigma of beauty. The enigma of beauty, a sanctuary perspective. And tonight we're not going to rush into the presentation. We're going to take it step by step as we unravel God's word through the sanctuary perspective. Now, if we don't finish tonight, we will continue with the presentation on Wednesday evening next week. Is that okay, Christian friends? Yes. Are you with me? Yes. All right. And so as we begin, we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit as we bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this opportunity to speak to you. Dear Lord, as we go into the this presentation, we invite the presence of your Holy Spirit here. May you enlighten us, prepare our hearts, and may we receive your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I must tell you that whenever I do this presentation in particular, I ask God for extra wisdom and enlightenment. Because this is not an easy presentation to present. Because it does ruffle quite a bit of feathers and step on quite a bit of toes. I can tell you that some of you may not necessarily like me at the end of the presentation. However, I can tell you that it is better to become your enemy by telling you the truth than to be dishonest and pretend to be your friend, not so? And so we go right into it. The word enigma is a synonym for mystery, right? something that is difficult to understand and so we're going to look at how do we clarify what is beauty or what is beautiful and we are going to do so from the eyes or through the lenses of the sanctuary in the book evangelism page 221 sister white says the correct understanding of christ's ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. This means that any doctrine or any truth that we hold can be clarified through the sanctuary, not so? Amen. So the Sabbath, marriage, forgiveness, the family, and even beauty can be taken from the perspective of the sanctuary. In our everyday society, we hear the phrase Java Sap, not so? And you know what it means. What does it mean? Something pretentious, not so? And there are many people walking around that are fake. And we don't just want to talk about a fakeness in terms of character, but rather tonight we want to be a little superficial. They have fake hair, not so? Fake eyelashes. They cover their blemishes with a fake complexion, fake bottoms, fake teeth, fake nails, and the list goes on, not so? Yes. And so what you think that you actually are seeing is maybe a mirage, it may be something pretentious, and, and not really what you put, what you perceive it to be. And then hence the phrase Java Sap. To set the proper foundation for our little talk tonight. We look at Isaiah chapter 3, verses 24. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 24. And we, I would like you to read together with me. After 2, 1, 2. Let us read. Instead of perfume, there will be rottenness. And instead of a girdle, a robe. And instead of well-set hair, boldness. And instead of a rich robe, a girding of sackcloth. And instead of beauty, shame. This text is telling us that we may start off with one thing, but end up with another if we do things for the wrong reason. Alright. And so, in order for us to talk about the mystery of beauty, or the enigma of beauty, we first need to know what beauty is. And so we begin with a basic definition. Beauty can mean a quality or a group of qualities which gives 
of a thing that gives pleasure to the eyes. It is often referred to as being graceful, ornamental, or of excellent quality. It can also mean loveliness. And we generally use the word beauty to describe a woman. Okay, not so if we were describing a man, we would have used words like handsome or good looking, but generally when we say beautiful, we refer to a female. Are you still with me, friends? Yes. All right. And so we are going to begin with little categories and we look at our perception of beauty. Deny it as you may, each one of us has a perception of what we think is beautiful. From the time you see someone, their character is not what impresses or turns you off. You look at their complexion, you look at their hair, you look at their dress, and you already have, you feel already in your mind, you already know whether you think they're good looking or not. Not so, whether they're attractive or not, whether this is a nice person or not a nice person, just by the way they look. And if we're honest with ourselves, we also categorize people by their race. I'm sure if you had to tell someone who Pastor Thomas's wife, who Pastor Thomas is, you'd probably say the pastor that's married to the Indian lady. Not so I've heard people say that. We distinguish people, whether we admit it or not, by how we look. Appearances, first appearances, often make first impressions. And so I'm going to show you four photographs of four women of four different races. And in their races, they are considered to be some of the most beautiful women. They are actresses and models. The first woman, you may recognize her from the movie 12 Years a Slave. And she's considered to be one of the most beautiful women of African descent. The second one, you would recognize, I'm sure some, most of you, Angelina Jolie, not so. And she's considered to be one of the most beautiful Caucasian women, or white women. The next woman is an Indian woman. Her name eludes me at this time, but she's considered to be in India, the most beautiful model around. And the final one, she's a Japanese model. I think her first name is Mokoi. In your mind, let us give them some time to settle. Okay. Welcome. In your mind, without me asking, you are already thinking which one to use the nicest, not so? And there is nobody to tell you whether this is right or wrong. So what if you prefer to see the Caucasian woman or the African woman or the Indian? Who's to tell you that this is wrong? What if you think that the Japanese is rather unattractive? Our perception of beauty begins actually in our minds. And if we had time, I'd ask maybe a gentleman who he thinks is the nicest of there. And I would not, your answer, there would be no wrong answer. Agreed, friends? I want to show you now three men. And you will notice when I showed you the women, you didn't laugh, right? They were all of different races, but you didn't laugh. You observed them and you formulated your opinion. Here we have an Arabian man. He will suffice for the Indian, the Caucasian at the bottom, and the Africans at the top. But you laugh them because in your mind, you think they're funny looking, right? And if you're honest, you think some of them were ugly, right? Who is single there? Sister Morris, you single? Which one of these would you like? <laughs> she said the black one, right? Because we formulate, we formulate opinions in our minds. That is what I want you to, to know tonight. We judge people, the first impression is often the impression that comes by looking at them physically. Agreed, Christian friends? All right, let's move on. Scientists would tell us that there is beauty in symmetry. Symmetry or symmetrical line is a line that is drawn from the top of the forehead to the, the base of the chin. And they would say that the more evenly distributed the features of the face are on either side, or the more symmetrical it is, 
the more beautiful the face. So they took this model, this lady, the original face, and they made it more symmetrical to the left. And then to the right, they made it more asymmetrical, or the opposite of, of symmetry. And they posted those three photos up on a school, a college board, and they told the students that these were triplets, and they asked them which one they found more attractive. And 100% of the students found the one with the symmetrical face, the modified face, to be more attractive. So scientists are saying the more evenly the space your eyes are, and the more evenly shaped your nose is, and your lips and so, the more attractive you are. They would go so far as saying that babies, newborns, prefer to see people with more symmetrical faces than persons with asymmetrical faces. Now, beauty is so integral that it is even portrayed in cartoons. From Jasmine in the movie Aladdin, you recognize some of these characters, no? Then there's Ariel, the little mermaid, Cinderella, Mulan, and I don't remember this one's name, perhaps you can help me out, right? I, Fiona? Okay. I, I want you to notice that all of, most of these cartoons, they are of different races, but the features are the same. All of them have big eyes that take up almost one third of their face. The nose is extremely small, so is the mouth. The chin is pointed. The neck is extremely thin. They're all slender. Small, perky bosoms, really tiny waists, on, almost unrealistic, and large hips. And that is what we portray to our children from the time they are young as being beautiful. So the little mermaid is beautiful because she has long hair and blue eyes. Cinderella is beautiful because she has blonde hair and she has a nice small light face. And in our minds we already form perceptions from the time we are young of what is beautiful or what is not. Some persons go to the extreme and actually make themselves look like cartoons. These are real people, okay? Here, this girl has modified her eyes by using eyeliner to give the illusion of the large eyes. She has undergone surgery to modify her nose, thin out her chin, make her waist extra small, and she says that she doesn't eat any food. All she lives on is water and egg. Just to keep the size of a Barbie doll. Now you would think that this is restricted just to women. This young man here wants to be like a real Superman. And he's actually a Filipino. Okay? That's him here. But he has undergone drastic surgery to restructure his face so he can look like the original Superman. His eyes are colored. He's no, he underwent no surgery. He modified his lips. He actually put in an implant to give him a cleft chin. And here we have the real Superman in the movie, Clark Kent, and we're, here we have him. So his, his fetish is Superman, and he will go to great extremes to accomplish that. Are you with me so far? Yes. All right, can we continue? Can we continue, friends? Are you asleep? No. All right. Beauty around the world. Now, different things mean different things for different people. Different strokes for different folks. And we're going to spend some time looking at what beauty means in different parts of the world. In China, women have to be very small, about a size 4. They're supposed to be very flat-chested, so big bosoms are not very popular in China and the skin has to be very light or pale, and the eyes must be very big. In the old, old English days, the women were very plump, but their skin had no marks or freckles. In addition, they would wear this corset to give the illusion of a very narrow waist and very big hips. Then we move over to Africa. In Africa, big women are considered beautiful. This is often associated with abundance and fertility. So the larger your hips, the more fertile you assume to be. In Japan, 
We have the opposite. Slim women are considered beautiful. The skin is smooth, the hair is dead straight, and of course, the skin is very pale. In India, sharp features are what are desirable. The nose must be sharp and straight, the eyes must be big, the emphasis in India is on the bosom and not so much on the hips and the bottom. However, in Latin American countries, the emphasis is on the hips and on the bottom. Are you still with me? Yes. All right. So in different parts of the world, different things appeal to different people. Now we lay the foundation. We're getting somewhere, OK? All right. However, if you were to ask, what is the ideal Caribbean woman? The answer would be very. However, in my little limited research, this is what I came up with. You speak to men and they tell you they like a woman with a nice complexion. They use the word nice loosely. Oftentimes, the word nice means light skin. If you're dark skin, remember this is, we're stating facts, right? You're often less popular. It is amazing that in the Caribbean setting, a dark skinned man is considered handsome, but sadly, women of similar complexions are not so desired. In addition, they will tell you they like nice hair. What is nice hair? I hear that so often. What does that mean? Oftentimes, that means long, it means straight, it means not kinky. And of course, they will tell you they don't like women too big. They don't like them too small. They like them nice and in between. Okay, so if you're too fat, you're not too popular. If you're too thin, you don't make it, okay? All right. However, in America, which sets the criteria for the world, the criteria is this. You must be tall and you must be blonde. You must actually be the height. I did my research, 5 feet 10. That's a little shorter than my husband. Your eyes must be blue, and you must be about 110 pounds. So that excludes all Caucasian women with brown hair, red hair, and, other, and black hair, as well as every other race. Okay? That's the tall, hot, blonde. She must be 5 feet 10, blonde hair, and blue eyes. And there's even a weight criteria. I don't remember the last time I was 110 pounds, okay? So I'm a long way from that. So let's move on. Now, in, in this life, many people, we want to be accepted. We want to be beautiful. And so persons throughout the world will undergo great changes or great modifications in order to accomplish that. And we're going to look at some of these. In Thailand, there's a particular group of women known as the Kayan women. And they, sorry, yes. And they undergo a custom known as neck elongation. In these cultures, they view beauty as having extremely long necks. So they put in rings around their neck that will give the illusion of a longer neck because what it does, the rings actually push down the collarbone, the clavicle, and the sternum, giving the il illusion that the neck is longer. This process is begun from the time the girls are very little, and more and more rings are added as they age until the neck reaches the desirable length. They wear this for the entire life. Next we have a, a, a tradition in China known as foot binding. In China, small feet are considered ladylike and dainty. So if you have a size 10 or 11 or 12, you don't make it, right? And so what the women would have done in those days is that they would have broken the foot, folded it underneath. You see the toes in this instance? You see it where they are? And then they would push the broken foot into a shoe, giving the appearance that the feet are small. Right, friends? You with us? You with me? All right. Then we move to Africa. And this is called, in this tribe, 
They use lip plates. <laughs> and all these things I'm telling you are true and they're factual. You can look at all of them if you so desire. All right, there an insertion is made in the lower lip of the girl from the time she's very young. And a plate is placed in her mouth and the plate is gradually, a larger and larger size is gradually used so that the lips can be lengthened further and further. Eventually they remove the, the, the plate and a large hollow space is left with the hip hanging. All right, they consider this beautiful and the women actually undergo this tradition so that they can be accepted in this society. In a specific place for Mauritania, we have another tradition known as force feeding. Now this is a very poor country. So the fatter you are, the more likely you are to be married. It shows you have wealth, it shows you have food, shows you have money to feed yourself. So from the time the girls are little, they are force fed. The grandmothers and mothers would actually beat them, forcing down mid down their throat, leading on to a rapid onset of obesity. And so as they get bigger and bigger, they are more desirable. So it is a good thing for a man to be walking by his side with a very fat woman. It means he can maintain her, it means he can feed her, it means he is wealthy. Okay? Yes, we are really shocked by some of these, right? Okay. In India, women, children, female children are not very desirable. This is because you have to pay for someone to marry your daughter. This is called a dowry. It means if you have a son, people pay you. But if you have a daughter, you have to pay the person to marry your daughter. And in those places, if you don't get married, that's a big shame. And so the women deck themselves to show how wealthy their parents are or how good a standing their, the families is that they come from. And so they pierce their ears and pierce their nose and then link a chain from the nose to the ears and have jewelry all in their hair and all in the neck and all on their hands, showing that the more jewelry you have, the richer you are, so the more desirable you are in these places. Are you still with me, friends? Yes. All right. And so we're moving away now from these, what we consider less developed countries, to the world of America and Europe. And you're going to see some very interesting things. The first one is called muscle worship. There you have two persons. You have a dominator, who is the bodybuilder, and you have the worshipper, who is the person who pays the dominator to touch or feel up or enjoy their muscles, okay? This can often be a sexual relationship, or it could simply be just a, a, a means to enjoy yourself or admire the worshipper, the dominator, okay? So persons actually make their living, this is the female hair, okay, you can see her, her mammary glands and her face, this is a female who's undergone body modifications so she can be a dominator. So people pay her to worship her muscles, okay. Then we move on to body piercings. This is the most pierced woman in the entire world. Her name is Elaine Davidson. She has to date 6,925 body piercings with 500 in her genitals alone. Every part of her body that you can think of is pierced. Okay? And she holds the record at in the Guinness Book of World Book of World Records as the most pierced woman. Next we move on to tattooing. Again, this is Miss Julia Noose. Approximately 95% of her body is tattooed. The only places that are not tattooed 
are her earlobes, underneath her eyes, and around her lips. So 95% of her body is covered in tattoos. Implants. So it's not enough for them to pierce themselves or to tattoo their bodies. Rather, they need to put in implants. And so they would inject the skull with some gelatin-like substance that would give the illusion of horns. And these are permanent. And of course, that was not enough. So you have shapes of starfish, all circles, triangles, whatever you want. Okay? You inject them and you, them, you flash those wonderful implants beneath the skin. We continue. Okay? And so they take it a step further. That's the same lady we saw previously. Here she has filed her teeth, right? To make it appear more vampirish. And if, mind you, these are not uneducated persons, you know, or drug dealers. These are actually professional people. Sometimes they teach at colleges, they lecture, they're lawyers. These, that's their way of life. Okay? This guy has holes in his nostrils. I guess his two nostrils were not sufficient. In his ears, his elbows, and all over. Implants continue. This one is called the donut head. And it's a temporary thing done just for fun, where, again, a gelatin-like substance is injected into the forehead. As the forehead becomes filled, it swells. And then you take your finger and you make an incision in the center to give the illusion of a donut. Why so anyone would want to carry a donut on their head, I do not know, right? Then this is one of the newest things around. It's called eyeball jewelry. Where little pieces of diamond or gold or silver are implanted, sorry, on the eyeball. Okay, and they say this is so new that they don't want to try it out yet. The people have lined up to have their eyeball jewelry inserted. All right. And then, of course, we know the world of plastic surgery. We're not happy with how God made our lips. Perhaps the white people believe their lips are too small, and the black people believe their lips are too thick. This lady wanted to look permanently, like her lips are permanently puckered, and so she went undergone plastic surgery for her lips. This woman holds the record presently for the largest breast implants in the world. Her breasts are so big that it actually crushes down on her ribs and can puncture her lungs, yet she still, still does this because she thinks this makes her beautiful. And of course, Many people are not happy with their nose. This young lady's nose had a bump hair, so she had it removed so that it can appear straighter. And these things really do sound ludicrous, not so? Not so, friends? Yes. Why would people go through such extremes to make themselves beautiful? Let's continue. This young woman was not happy with the size of her hips in the water. So she, Sister Jenuka Sakuma, right? So she made, she made, she made them change, right? So that the person can be accepted. So that she can be accepted, right? And of course, we're all familiar with the black man that the person that was born as a black man but died looking like a white woman, right? The famous Michael Jackson. I don't know if you look at how he looked originally. He does, really does look like a handsome young man. He really does look like somebody you see and say he's nice looking. But he was not happy with himself. Right now, I don't. You can't tell whether he's female or male, whether that's a nose or a lips or. An, he had undergone so much surgery in his nose that his nose could, there was no longer any nose bridge, cartilage or any further surgery to be done. So they do one, and then they do another, and another, and another, and they're never satisfied at what they see. And oftentimes I find they end up looking uglier than when they started. 
And so this is where I want to spend a little bit of time tonight. And this is when you might not want to agree with what we will present. Because you see, everything I have presented here to you is a bit, is a bit strange. Because it comes from a very weird culture. It's taboo. Why would somebody want to lengthen their neck? Why would somebody want to break their foot? Why would somebody want to feed themselves till they die of a heart attack? However, in these cultures like Thailand, Africa, and India, and Mauritania, all these women do those things so that they can survive. This is not an excuse I'm making for them, but if they don't undergo those changes, they will not get married, they'll be outcasts of society, and there'll be nobody to take care of them. However, in the Caribbean, we do many things that are taboo. If the people were supposed to hear about the, some of the things we did, I'm sure they'd be just as surprised. And so we want to spend some time looking at appendages, things that men and women do right here in St. Lucia so that we can look beautiful. Are you still with me? Yes. And so we begin with the first one, the wonderful world of we. And I'm happy that this was not stated by a Christian. The first video on this was actually done by Chris Rock in his video, Indian Remy. Here, you have an Indian worshiper. She goes to a hair temple. At the end of her worship, her entire head is shaved. You see her look bald now, right? And she's given a few cents for her hair. This hair is washed, it is bad, and it is sent to places like Europe and America, where one piece of extension would sell for 3,000 pounds. And of course, there is the Indian Remy weave on an actress. Tell me why you would take somebody else's hair some place where you do not know the person and you put it on your own hair because you think that your hair is not adequate. Does that make sense to you? Doesn't that sound ludicrous to you? Now, I often hear our sister say, oh, I like myself. I, I like myself. I like my complexion. I like my nose. I like my hair. Really? You really like your hair? You really like your skin color? You really like your nose? Who told you that by putting on those things you are any more beautiful? How can putting something fake, unreal, unnatural, be more beautiful than what God gave you? Isn't that something to think about? And they fool us so much that they now have top classes of weave. So people no longer go with the plastic or synthetic weave because it doesn't curl as nicely. So you now go for natural weave. So in your mind, you're telling yourself that I, I look better, you know, because it's actually natural hair. And I can curl it and I can straighten it and I can color it. So you import hair from all parts of the world. This one here is Peruvian hair, Malaysian hair, Eurasian, that's a mixture between Europe and Asian, so the hair is a little different. Indian weave and Brazilian weave. Because somebody, <laughs> but the more is that's why I say Lucian weave, right? Because somebody, Christian friends, I notice you're getting quiet on me, right? Right? Because somebody told you that the hair you were born with was not adequate. Somebody told you that it had to be straight. Somebody told you that it had to be long. And so you would go to a store and buy a piece of hair and sew it in your hair and then style it and shake it like it's yours. I just don't get it. Do you get it? And let me tell you a little secret. Ask the men around. Go home, ask your husbands, your brothers, your fathers. How many of them actually like those things? A man, I would think, would naturally like to pass his hand on top of or through his wife's hair. 
what is going there is that there's a trap there, there's a trap there, then seriously? And then these ladies will tell you, don't touch my hair, I just did it, you know. And we laugh, but that's true. You go to the beach, you cannot bathe. You go to the river, you cannot enjoy yourself. You, you cannot even get wet in the rain because you have done your hair. No, but for who did you do it? I, I know, I guess my husband likes hair because he married an Indian and sometimes he let the window down and I'd say, but I need to comb my hair. He said, just pass your hand and that. In other words, men like hair and if he didn't like your hair, he would not have married you. And so, why are you changing yourself to be more acceptable to some person, to, to, to acceptable to whom? Who said, if the God of heaven made you with that hair, who is who's the... The, the movie maker or the model person to tell you that it is inadequate. Isn't that true for God, sisters? The Bible tells us that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. God took time to style your hair. He took time to set the protein bonds and the secondary bonds and all of that in place. But we go and pay great money to straighten it or cover it or break it only to make ourselves sick in the process. You still with me? Yes. And so there are many side effects of hair extension. Okay? They can lead to blinding headaches, hair loss, bleeding, and sometimes permanent hair damage that is called alopecia. It means the hair doesn't grow back where the trap was. And sometimes it can have other effects like bad odor because you can't always take care of it the way you take care of your natural hair. In addition, dandruff, or even improper hygiene, because you buy this thing and it's so expensive so that you don't want it to get wet, so you always have to, have to keep it there, as opposed to washing your hair every week, every two weeks, and these things can lead to improper hygiene. So these are some of the basic side effects. Now, we go to another category, wigs. Now, I am not, don't, I am not a fanatic. I'm not saying that you cannot wear a wig. You don't have cancer, you're not going bald, you don't have extreme scalp condition, but you're going to buy a piece of thing to cover your hair, your entire hair. Because someone told you, now we're not talking about people as their age and their hair falls out, or maybe you have a special skin condition, the scalp is blistering and you don't want everybody to see your business, you cover it up. There are situations where you use that. But this is not the case, but you're going to cover up your hair because you want it to appear in a certain color, in a certain texture, and in a certain length. Because someone told you that the hair you had is not adequate. And this is the one I really want to get to. Those with straight hair want it curly, and those with curly hair want it straight. People are not pleased. so. We go out of our way to do things. And there are several, several, several dangers of those chemical straighteners. And they say, a picture speaks a thousand words. And so I'm going to show you the photos first. Severe burning, permanent hair loss on all fronts. And you, go, and you go through that pain because someone told you that the hair combs better. Or my friends would tell me I don't have a clue, right? They have to do their hair because it's easier to maintain. And I don't doubt that. But at what cost? To what end? And let's move away from the photos and look at some of the facts. Whenever there is, and I have the link here so you can check it out, right? Whenever there is a blister or a scar in the scalp, the chemical actually gets into the scalp and leads to complications. We're gonna start off with the simpler ones. Blindness, you can lose your eyesight because you straighten your hair. Reproductive problems, fibroids, heart disease, cognitive disorders, disorders of the mind, cancers, Early puberty, wondering why the child developing so early. Altered or weakened immune systems and other health risks. Professionals will tell you that if you're actually having problems with conceiving, 
get off the chemical straightener and you can actually conceive easier. Ever notice that diseases like fibroids are a disease that affects women of color? Why is that so? Studies have shown that there, there is actually a relationship between the chemical straightener, the cold press, and the fibroids. And I like this statement here. It says, many African women still do not know that they are risking their lives by straightening their hair. You are risking your life. And I didn't say that, you know. They are risking, you are risking your life by straightening your hair. And these things have to be monitored. The chemical in it is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is what we use to pro preserve dead bodies or organs in the lab. Okay? It's a carcinogenic agent. That means it's a cancer-causing agent. However, who monitors? You think they really monitor how much formaldehyde they put in the products? You want your hair straighter faster and you want it to last longer. So they'll put formaldehyde in it at a greater um, quantity so that you can purchase it better. And that's actually, ever wonder why when you're in the hair salon they tell you to open up the place? Because just simply inhaling it is dangerous. Okay? And because of the improper mon um, monitoring, many products have some quantities in excess of what they're supposed to have. Okay, Christian friends? Yes. And just Google dangers of chemical straighteners and it will, millions and millions of sites will pop up. This is not something that women can say they did not know. The, the information is all around and scientists will tell you that more research needs to be done to actually establish these links. Okay? And I shared this with a few of my colleagues and I asked them, what is the price tag that you place on your life? Is your life more important or are your looks more important? And sadly, most people feel that this is just for a time and they want to look good. One told me that she'll take her chances. Another one says, what in this world does not have side effects, right? And I know some of you may be thinking that. Some said that's what the men like. So she's doing it for that audience. Another one said she cannot get a job with her natural hair. And she said, beauty, this other one said, beauty is pain. So if you don't experience pain, then you can't gain beauty. And sadly, this is the mentality of a lot of our sisters here today. And they have gone, taken it so far that they want to tell us what means, what is hair of a good quality? And this test is called the pencil test. And it means that you take a pencil, a sharpened pencil, and you insert it into the hair. The faster it comes out, or uncurls, the better quality the hair. And <laughs> that's not for bald people, Brother Morris. <laughs> and the, the, if it stays inside, then the hair is of a poorer quality. That's for the pencil test. But who do you think invented those things? If we complain, Sister Morris said men. <laughs> if, if we complain about these things, then invent new rules. Wear your hair proudly. Show that you don't need to bleach your skin and cover up who you are. And that alone will cover a skin. When you come and say, I'm proud of who I am, but you're doing all those things, really? It's a little ironic. Then, of course, it's not enough to, to change the hair altogether. We must dye it. So, I have Indian hair, but it's not good enough. So, I must streak it blonde so I can look more Caucasian, right? That will make me look nicer. And so, they make us feel we have the same woman hair and red hair, blonde hair and black hair, all because she can change it up. If God wanted me with blonde hair, wouldn't he have made me with blonde hair? Why should I modify it? And they come up with all kinds of things. Change it up. You do a different style. Feel good about yourself. If I have to change my hair to feel good about myself, then something is really wrong. There are so many things you can do to make yourself feel better. 
And I will say this to people and they'll not believe. If I have to wait, I like compliments from my husband, but I do not rely on his compliments to know who I am. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. In other words, before he came, I thought I was beautiful. So if he leaves and, and um, separates or divorces or dies, what happens? Do I cease to be beautiful? Do I cease to be precious to God? In other words, when you know who you are, and then he compliments you with that, then, then you can go. But you have to love yourself first. Sisters, you cannot wait for a man to validate you. That doesn't last very long. We get all the thing with the boobs head south and the head turns gray and the body changes shape, right, Brother Morris? You have a weakness. And so you will not always look the same way, right? Look last year, though no, October, my husband will tell me you are so so fat. Look on plum. Now, when he sees, I showed him the picture in October, he said, You're a really skinny princess. In other words, I've gained so much weight now that back then when he thought I was fat, I was not fat. So it shows you we, we change. As we age, that's a natural part of life, right? And so, by loving who you are from the start, means that you do not need to seek other person's validation. I'm not saying it doesn't feel nice. Of course, it's wonderful when you are complimented, especially by your spouse. That's integral, that's important. But that is not what is supposed to make you know whether you are beautiful or not. Amen? Amen. Now, we're, we're wrapping up this segment. Of course, we'll not finish, but we will see where we, we can arrive. Fakes. Fake males. Fake eyelashes, and these days there's a new thing called fake bottoms. They make panties that are parted, so when you put them on, you have bigger Unimus Maximus, right? Now you know that can simply, that's the butt muscle, Brother Morris, right? Now, what that means is, friends, you can simply go and do a few squats or a few sit ups or a few jobs and that was, oh, Sister Morris said it takes too long. <laughs> All right, so, but imagine you're dating someone and you've had these fake underwears for the whole time, and all the time the man thinking that you have a big bottom. Well, on his wedding night, if you do that as Christian way, then he's in for a big surprise, right? And these days they have gone so far as putting after they paint their nails, I notice a new trend. You put the, they put the two in the middle in a different color. So it's not enough to put like five in red. They put five in red and maybe the middle finger in orange. And we, or green. And we don't know where these things come from, but we just adopt them. We just take them. You don't know what, what roots it had in whatever, but we just take it because it's fashionable. Really? It's fashionable to have red and green nails? That's very strange to me. And this is one. I want to spend a little time on my husband would say, dance on that, right? In other words, make up. What does the word imply? And they will tell you nice things like, put light foundation and, and, and natural lip color and, and all of that, right? As if to see that the lighter it is, it's okay because it's light. Really? Make up. Make up. You're making up for something that you're saying that you don't have. And these things actually make you more dependent. Because as you cover your pores, your skin cannot breathe. And so you get more acne. And so you get more scars. And so the skin doesn't heal. So you become permanently addicted to these things because you need them. And you don't know what these things are made up of. The lipstick is actually made from pig fat. The foundation is actually made from things like sea cucumbers and coral reefs in the ocean where they have to extract it. And we take these things and we put them on our face. Because somebody told us this, it, it would, and sometimes some people put it so heavy, it looks like a mask. And underneath it you can see all the little buttons because the skin cannot breathe. And then after they have the foundation, you must have, what were the days when it was just lip balm? Now it's lipstick. 
And so your eyes must be a certain color, your lips must be a certain color, your fingernails must be a certain color. And this morning my husband saw one, what you call her? I can't remember. <laughs> I don't know if it was a gorilla or clown or something. But it, it really does make you, you already, I just don't get, you already dark skin. You take a purple thing, put it there, put orange eyes and, I mean seriously, does that make you look more beautiful? It rather, it makes you look rather stupid. Because if God wanted you to have any of those things, you'd have put it naturally. Not so, friends? Not so? You're still speaking to me, right? And this one I just don't get. Tell me why anyone would shave their natural eyebrow and then take a pencil and draw in a new eyebrow and be permanently separate. So you're always looking like that, right? And sometimes they don't draw it the same length. So you have one higher up and one lower down. But that is beautiful. To me, the nicer little hair is prettier than the thin pencil. The point we want to make is if God desired for any of those things to be present, He would have made it so. Our God created us perfectly. And so there's nothing lacking. And there's a term in biology called biodiversity. It means variability of living in living things. If all the flowers looked the same, there would be no, you wouldn't be able to make a bouquet. Because they all look the same. But when you take a dive under the ocean, you see all the variety of fish. You see beauty in the forest because there are different types of trees. And when you look at people, there are different variety of people, different shapes and colors and complexions and sizes. Because God made it so. God took his time and he enjoyed making it. Right, friends? And as we wrap up for tonight, tanning versus bleaching. Look at how dark this lady made herself. And you know this guy, right? Vibes Cartel, yes. Vibes Cartel is a black man that bleached his skin so he could look more white. And the white people and the go turn into that they can look more dark. But he said, may see. Walking billboards. Now, let me make a disclaimer. I am not saying that there is anything wrong with brand names. As a matter of fact, it is better if I were to purchase a sneaker, I would buy maybe a night air because that would last me a year or two or three, rather than buy a fun step that I would need to replace every two months. So it's not, to, it's not being a good steward. Similarly, if I needed a bag, you buy one for 100, it matches up. The next month, you have to buy another one the next month. So you invest in a good brand, a land, a pack, something, and it lasts you for about 10 years, and you have that there. However, some people are so dependent on those things that they cannot wear anything else. Now tell me why, who is Sean John? Who is Tommy Hilfiger that you have to wear his name on your shirt? Who is Kenneth Cole? Maybe some homosexual over in Italy. But that's who you wear, right? Kenneth Cole. And some people cannot afford their food, but they ensure they have $300 US shoes. Not so? Yeah. And tell me why a polo, which is normally about $30, will not reach 400 US, 200 US, because somebody inscribed on it, Ralph Lauren. Is it more durable? Is the thread of gold or silk? What makes those things, would you walk around with a shirt that says Pastor Tom Devron Thomas? Yes. <laughs> Because, because Brenda Morris said it is for free. Because his name, then you cannot assign a monetary value. But you walk around with somebody saying Jeffrey Bean. I mean, sometimes it's really, really ludicrous. There are things you spend in because it's an investment. But you do not make these things your God so much so that you have to wear them. Okay, friends? And. Oh, this one is very interesting. Yeah. Nowadays, men have pedal pushers, right? Yeah. Men in tights. Yeah. And to tell, say that we love Jesus, we have to have a wristband saying, I love Jesus. Yeah. Or oh, I'm saved. And you see the young men cut their hair as mohawks. Yeah. Whatever the race, they leave the center and they put it up with gel. 
Where did that come from? And then you cannot distinguish in the, the men's suits and the ladies' suits. It's unisex. Oh, and this one is very interesting. The, the entrance of dreadlocks into the SDA church. Now, I want to be very careful so that you don't misunderstand me. In the Adventist church, we generally do not baptize, but I can speak for my husband. Somebody comes to you for bat baptism and they have dreadlocks. You ask them to cut it. Yes. Not so? Yes. Yet that person who's been growing their locks for years will come into the church and see Adventists with their dreads. Isn't that a little hypocritical? Yes. Why should I do that? Now, if I came to you with a red mark in the center of my head, you think I was crazy. However, in India, women that are married wear the, the red powder in their forehead. It signifies something then. So if I do this, you would say she's not a Hindu. Probably Madam Pastor, may, may buy a um, Hindu or Tetley. Because you identify the red powder with the Hindu religion, not so? Yes. What then do we identify dreadlocks with? Rastafarians. Rastafarians. Not Seventh day Adventists. This is not a hairstyle. This is not anything that people are trying to step down on black people. Whenever you see locks, whether they're bongo or sano locks, locks are locks. They mean rasta. Not so? And so, when you tie it up nicely, or you curl it up, or you let it loose, it signifies something. If you're Adventist, if you're Adventist, the same way you not want to be identified with any other sect, any other religion, let us live like Adventists. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Alright. And finally, we will stop here for tonight. Princess or prostitute? we come, we see a trend, we take it and we bring it in the church. These pumps, or whatever they are called, platform shoes, do you know where they came from? They originated in the strip clubs. And these, they try to make it a little modified where they cover the, the, the platform, yes. But when the strippers around the pool in their, their lingerie, they wear these. To further make you identify them as strippers, they have patterned stockings. We're not talking about the plain stockings that are brown or nude or charcoal that, or gray that you wear. We're talking about those things with all the zigzags and the X's and the hearts and the stuff that when you put on you, people cannot tell if that's your skin or if that's a tattoo because these things originated in the brothel. They are not accepted. I work in the ministry and they are not accepted as work, at work. So if they are not accepted at work, why do you think they are accepted at church? We don't do things because they are fashionable. We do things because they are, we represent Jesus. And so we are not able to get to the sanctuary perspective. It's 8.30, we have to stop and I would want to hear one or two feet back from you. However, the point we want to make is, if we don't have time to make it next week, is that true beauty is only found in Jesus. Amen. And we're going to take it from that perspective next week. In other words, there are many things, and you were so appalled by the Chinese and the Africans, yet we right here do so many things that I'm sure that they themselves would consider taboo. Christian friends, if we are Christians, let us read. Let us represent Jesus, whether we are at work, at church, or at home. A lot of these things are difficult, and they'll require unlearning them. They'll require making hard, deci hard decisions, standing up for yourself, what you represent, what you look like. People may not like it, but at the end of the day, this is who you are. And always remember that God created you in this position. So maybe my husband can just touch on it briefly and then I'll take my sister and wrap So just speak to the, the love issue, well, the baptism issue. Yeah, I think, I think you, you, she, did, she did clarify this quickly there. 
Um, in, in relation to that, Sister James, the thing is, Seventh-day Adventists, we stand for something. And um, in our context, I, I'm not too much concerned about what is happening in Europe. I'm not in Europe, I'm not in America. I'm in the Caribbean, and particularly I'm in St. Lucia. The LOX is a symbol of Rastafarianism. Um, whether we like it or not, that is what it represents in the Caribbean, particularly in St. Lucia. It therefore follows that because it represents that in our culture, not that the hair is a moral evil, like to murder, to steal, or to kill. These are moral evils, and these are transcultural. This is why, again, you notice the principles that were coming out, so we try to use those principles to apply to the various circumstances. So in such a case, it's not that the head is a moral evil. So our context says that wearing your head like that is associated with a particular religion. And as a consequence, to demonstrate that you do not belong to that religion, you cut it off, and regardless of the culture says, it becomes, if the culture says it's fashion, it's still associated with the religion. And as a consequence, to show that you have no association with the religion, because there is such principle in scripture that is to show that Christianity is distinct, we're not Rastafarians, you cut off your dreads. I do not know why some pastors still baptize people with uh, blocks. I, I don't think. Yeah. Yes. Well, actually, you're not pleasing me. Um, it's, 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 like I said, it's a principle, uh, Sister James, but I understand, what you, I understand what you're saying. Personally, I will not baptize you. Amen. If a person has wrongs, I'm not going to baptize Amen. you. I'll be more than happy to put the scissors in their head and chop it off. Whether it be male or female. And, um, but, but some people might say, well, what, what, why make a big deal? Why, why make a big fuss about hair? Well, the thing is, God told Adam and Eve not to eat a fruit. You could say, what about a fruit, really? You know, that same fruit God told them not to eat, that same tree told them not to eat the fruit of it. You know, in the new heaven and the new earth, we will be eating from that fruit. You know that. As a matter of fact, in Revelation, it is the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. These are the two trees. You know this in Revelation, it says that on either side of the tree is the tree of life. And between there, the river of life passing through. So we might, someone is wondering, is, is the tree, does the tree trunk or the stem have a hole in there? No, 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 it's actually two trees. Uh, it is just referred to as the tree of life, but it's actually the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil on either side. And at the top, it forms a canopy. So it's not just about laws. It's not just about food. It's about what God says. It is the principles that are learned in Scripture. Okay? Yes. No, I think that that cannot happen. Anywhere I'm pastoring, that will not happen. Corruption taking place. <laughs> no, it will not happen. I just want to give my personal testimony on what you just discussed in terms of the hair. I lived in the States for quite some time and I realized that my hair was perm before. But I realized I was having a problem, especially during winter. And the problem is not that, but thick skin would just lift up when I comb my hair. This is what was coming out. And my son, my daughter, my husband was even afraid of touching my hair because this thing is really affecting my scalp. So I spoke to my friend in New York and I was saying, but what is going on? You know, this is happening to me. She said to me, girl, you don't know when the black women die in the mortuary when they do the examination of, you know? She said, when they pull back the black women's skin, this Yes, that's true. Under it is some slime resting there, and it is re as a result of the perm they've been putting in their hair. I say, oh, oh, so this is what is already happening to my on the outside. <laughs> so I stop putting it. And believe you me, I didn't go to no beauty place to cut it. I cut it myself. Yeah. Because if you come to my house, you'll see my hair really long. 
when I had the from when I had to test them, when I um, from the time I wrote that one, I have no scalp problem again. Amen. 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 Yes, Sister Trans, last comment, right as we close. You know, sometimes you may just assume that persons know. And I have come to understand that because people see passion, they, that's all they see. Okay. And I remember very, very early, the first thing that started creeping in was anklet. And one, not of our religion, but I used to be teaching at the Anglican school, and I remember, well, I mentioned his name because he's, to me, a principal person. And when he saw a certain teacher with anklet,